Thank you very much. And so I'm here to talk about internet dating, specifically um, that we're really having a love affair with behavioral science. Um, so I've worked in the dating, internet dating business for 20 years. That's my wife, my other half, and she's worked with me for the last 15 years. And we run a little website called Online Personals Watch if you really want a deep dive on the dating industry. We've been pretty nutty about looking at the dating industry for the last uh, ooh, 14 years now. So we summarize the news every day. It's quite a research tool at this stage. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, give you a quick run over of the internet dating industry and four examples of behavioral science behavior in the dating context and three reasons why, three problems that we have, three huge problems that we have in the dating industry. Some ground setting, 53% of single people have created a dating profile at this stage and one in six are actually quite addicted to internet dating. Um, millennials more so, incidentally. These numbers are from Match. And 19% of couples have met through internet dating at this stage. So it is beyond stigma at this stage. Um, second is through friends. And this is from The Knot, which is a married, married website. So how about this progression? How has behavior changed over time? Of course, 20 years ago, it was all about classifieds and flat, boring classifieds in newspapers. And so the first way that we really evolved behavior beyond um, flat, boring classifieds is we allowed search. Instead of grooming through pages and pages of classifieds, you could say, I want this, this, and this, and that would pop a list. Of course, the problem with that is myopia. People have an idea of what they want, and they stick to it. Um, the second big area was communications. For the first time, you didn't have to send a letter. You could actually communicate very quickly. So you see the pattern here. The speed is, is moving very quickly. Now we're going from very slow search to very switch, quick search, far more quick communications. But the biggest area I think that we have to improve over flat, boring personals is through compatibility. And this is the area I'm really excited about because it's virgin territory. You know, eHarmony, there's a lot of room for improvement. The science is very virgin at this stage. The industry has had real th three hiccups in, in this progression over time. Plenty of Fish, actually a company I worked for some while with, was a free dating site, and they became freemium. They really were a big hiccup to the dating industry. Along with mobile, they really changed behavior by speeding up, getting people addicted. It used to be that people would be on a dating site once or twice a day, maybe. Now they're on dating apps many, many, many times a day. Um, you know, look at Tinder. And of course, Tinder's the biggest hiccup. Look, there's the hiccup right there, the yellow line. That's Tinder. Uh, then we've got, you know, Match, Plenty of Fish, but that's the Tinder effect. Adam Alter addressed this last year, though. People aren't that happy with internet dating, unfortunately. He said that people spend about nine minutes a day on rela relaxation apps, exercise, reading apps, and they're generally pretty happy afterwards. After they've been on these apps, they report being happier. Dating, social networking, and gaming, they're on for a half hour a day or so, and they're not happy. They don't, they're not feeling more elated at the end of the sessions. But it's worse than that. Um, this is a consumer reports analysis of 115,000 that were surveyed. All the, the companies down the left are, um, you know, all the top dating companies basically down here. Oh, this does not work. All right. So <clears throat> the red is bad, green is good, in short. And you see there's one shining beacon of hope, and that is Tinder for, for being free, Tinder for value. The rest of it is a plague of discontent, unfortunately. Um, but it gets worse. I mean, we, we have all these strange apps coming out. I mean, this is hater. And so hater matches people based on their dislikes. Um, and they got 200 grand in funding from Mark Cuban, no less. So it's a very strange industry, I'll tell you. Never a dull moment, which is why I've been in it so long. Uh, there's a lot of potential. At the end of the day, I think we have great potential to really help people improve their relationships. Not only, you know, what, what I live for is that we'll figure out how to not only help people get it together, but keep it together. That's the holy grail. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But the reality is right now is a lot of dating apps that are just hanging on. Um, they're, they're not at critical mass. There's a lot of VC money that is now dried up and no one's really raising money these days. Let's talk about user behavior. In 2004, I was VP at Cupid.com and my CEO said, go talk to this guy. So I went to, uh, uh, go talk to this guy at MIT. So I went to MIT and I sat down and had a chat with Dan Ariely. Dan Ariely was the, was the professor he wanted me to talk to. 
and he rocked my world. He completely changed my perspective on the dating industry. One of the things that he talked about was halo effect. And so let me tell you about halo effect in the context of internet dating. So when you look at a profile on an internet dating site, you'll see some information. And you'll probably see some positive things that you like about that person. And if it's a fairly short profile, you'll tend to fill in the blanks. You'll give them the benefit of the doubt on the other elements of their profile. And you'll probably proceed. The fact of the matter is, people are very eliminatory when it comes to dating profiles. They'll look at a profile and try and move on quickly, because there are so many of them. Shorter profiles are better, funnily enough, which is counterintuitive. For the dating site metrics, it's better to have a shorter profile, because people will give them the benefit of the doubt, of the doubt thanks to the halo effect. And the trick is having just enough. There are, of course, the showstopper criteria, like do you, uh, do you want to get married? Do you have kids? Do you want to have kids? Do you smoke, actually, as a showstopper criteria as well? At the end of the day, our job is to get people out on a date. Another example uh, from Plenty of Fish. So there's a saying in the industry that men lie about wanting a long-term relationship, and women lie about wanting a short-term relationship. Um, so let me tell you about this example on Plenty of Fish. If, as a guy, as an example, you go on Plenty of Fish and say, I'm interested in a long-term relationship in your profile, and then you proceed to search for a casual relationship, then the database will corral around you so that the woman who has said she's only interested in a long-term relationship doesn't see you. Not until you change your search behavior, at least. So what we've done is we've kind of ignored what you said and focused on what you're doing, which is searching for a casual relationship. And so it's very rudimentary. It's really actually quite rudimentary. But that's an example of how, uh, I mean, this was several, seven, 10 years ago in use. Another example is virtual gifts. And this is really weird. Um, so one of the things, I was, I was working with Viximo many years ago, which was a, a kind of a virtual gifting company. Let me explain. One of the things that people did back then was they'd spend five, 10 bucks on a virtual rose. So they'd spend five or $10 to send a rose to someone, absolutely nutty. So we figured, OK, maybe, maybe there's a more <laughs> respectful way we can you know, extract money out of people. So we created the serious member membership for 6 to $10 a month, depending on how long you signed up. For 6 to $10 a month, you got this badge on your profile. And that was it. <laughs> Nothing else. So essentially, it was like virtually gifting yourself. One of the things that we noticed is that people would virtually gift themselves gifts um, uh, to make themselves look more popular. So we figured essentially this was like buying yourself a virtual gift, but a little bit more respectful of the context. And it worked very, very well. It was very lucrative. One of the things, um, so I studied at LSE, uh, their executive MSc behavioral science program, which I highly recommend. And, um, while I was there, I got to thinking, so why, just, why is it that Tinder did very well versus Hot or Not, which came 10 years before? How come Tinder did so well? Hot or Not, by the way, basically with the point of realization that I had was that um, when you're on Tinder, it's very much system one, right? It's very shareable, it's fun, it's a game, and all you're doing is swiping, right? Very emotional, like, don't like, like, don't like, don't like, like, like. It's very much system one, whereas um, Tinder, uh, hot or not rather, was very much system two, because they, instead of doing the swiping, they, they had the one to 10 score. So just because they had the num numerical score, that drove uh, the user firmly into system two. And that's a very different territory to be in. So the lesson here is that if you're designing mobile apps, design for system one. You try and get it emotional. Um, it's far more lucrative, and the users seem to like it. Designing for simplicity on mobile is extremely important. Don't make them think. In fact, there's a book by his name, which I recommend, by Steve Krug. It's, people are also moving towards um, video and pictures. Generation Z is all about images, all about communicating through video, whereas uh, millennials were texting. The next generation is all about video and pictures. The biggest challenges, I promise you three, the three biggest challenges that the dating industry has right now. The number one is the feedback problem. And so we do not know when we've been successful, which is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. 
Of course, Facebook does. So Facebook has just announced that they, um, they're going to do a dating app, a standalone dating app, which is a, kind of amazing because they solve this problem immediately. They can see when somebody is in a relationship, when they've changed their status, they can see who they're in a relationship, and they can see if it lasts and how long it lasts. This information is very important for the iterations that they can then make to their algorithm to improve. Real powerful stuff right there. Um, the limited information problem is the second problem. People don't really know what they want, and they don't really self-describe very well. Um, we have to get beyond that. We have to look at behavior to get the, to the truth of what they really want and who they are. And then we've got to infer character traits on those behaviors. Another kettle of, uh, you know, another, another great challenge. Facebook, I think, has a shot at doing this. They have a far bigger realm to pull data from and behavioral data specifically. Then we have the continuity problem, not to mention the continuity problem. If we do a good job, we wave goodbye to our customers. What kind of an incentive base is that? How does that incentivize us to do a good job? So I, I think Facebook also has the ability to solve this problem. The ultimate solution to this is the, by solving, to get to, get to number three, it's, in, it's imperative to solve number one and two. Um, if we have more data, if we have more ability to understand who we are, who our users are, then we should be not able, not only able to help people get it together, but keep it together, right? So I see a world where 10, 20 years down the line, you're still a member of that, you know, Facebook dating or whatever it is, that, that, and you're getting little nudges, you're getting some in, information like, it's about time to take her out on a date, and by the way, you should probably take her here, because you know, you gave us these preferences in the past and we've observed that she's kind of interested in this particular place for a date. Um, guys need help, certainly. Project 0D8, uh, I want to end with giving you a quick uh, overview of a new little project which I've launched, which is uh, 0D8.com. And what I'm trying to do is introduce top-tier academics with the dating industry. Um, ultimately, we need help. <laughs> we really need help. I don't think we realize it, though, unfortunately, <laughs> which is a real challenge. But I think... If we have, um, you academics want data. We've got a lot of data, but we don't know what to do with it. And we need help. So it seems like a marriage made in heaven, really. Um, so what I hope to do with this project is introduce top tier academics with the dating industry so we can then, they can do great papers, we can get great feedback, and hopefully the world will be a happier place. Thank you very much.